Sim, pai. Sim. Sim. you for this choir that you have so kindly given to me to take with me when I leave here. <laughs> oh, choir. I see old Lucy Mosby up there. And Kevin was talking about with Leslie and David when we were, we were a few years behind Lucy. Stand up, Lucy, so everybody can see you. We used to look up to Lucy, and now I know why. <laughs> Oh, Lucy and the whole choir, what a blessing you are to the whole music ministry. You are a blessing. You are a blessing. You really are. And to all of my friends of many years and, and new friends and to, to Dr. Jones and the, the, the deacons and trustees, the staff, the leadership, the membership of Friendship Missionary Baptist Church. To all who are guests this morning, and especially to your, your pastor, Dr. Jones, um, I, I can't say enough about him. Um, this, this brother is a man of God. He really is. He really is. And he's the one in the purple shirt. I'm the one in the green tie. <laughs> but I, I so very much thank him for um, his kind invitation and, and, and genuine hospitality and welcome. And my old friend, Kevin Patterson, who's a lot older than he looks, but he is. <laughs> And to be with him and David and Leslie and, and Lucy and, and my wife Sharon and Lizzie. It is a privilege and a blessing to be here this morning, to be in the house of God, and to be with the people of God. And Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered together in his name, there he will be in the midst of them. Dr. Jones, there are more than two or three here, which means Jesus is here big time, <laughs> big time. It's, it's good to be here. In fact, turn and tell your neighbor, you know something? It's good to be here. Turn to it's good to be here. It is good to be here. Well, allow me, if you will, to offer a word from Matthew. So if you'll take out your Bible, if you have the literal book or if you have the virtual book on your iPhone or tablet like this, Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, beginning at verse 34. Matthew 22, beginning at verse 34. When you find it, say, thank you, Jesus. If you can't find it, help me, Lord. <laughs> Somebody nearby, help you out. Matthew 22, in the Word, beginning at the 34th verse. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, any lawyers in the house this morning? Yeah, I know y'all ain't admitting it, but I know there's some here. 
I know David Edmonds is back there. Who else? Oh yeah, uh, Sharik's. Oh yeah, we got we got young lawyers, old lawyers. Yep. When we 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 like Jesus lawyers. That's, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. All the law and the prophets. It has been variously attributed to a number of people. The quote has some early origins when you Google it. It may have first been said by Prime Minister William Gladstone of Great Britain in the 19th century, but it has also been attributed to Mohandas Mahatma Gandhi in India's freedom struggle in the 20th century. But I never met William Gladstone in the 19th century. I studied of Gandhi, but I never met him, so I didn't meet, hear, him, hear him say it. I actually heard it said by Jimi Hendrix. I know y'all in church, but, and I know the pastor's sitting here, but y'all know who Jimi Hendrix was. Don't act like you ain't never heard of Jimi Hendrix. J Jimi said it this way, when the power of love overcomes the love of power, then and only then will the world know peace. Repeat after me, when the power of love overcomes the love of power, then and only then will the world know peace. I want to talk this morning on the subject, there's power in love. Power in love. There's power in love to lift up and liberate, power in love to help and heal. Love is that healing balm in Gilead that can make the wounded whole. Love is that healing balm in Gilead that can heal the sin-sick soul. It's power. Like the other song says, wonder work and power. There's power in love. Go and tell your neighbor he's talking on the subject. There's power in love. Just tell your neighbor. Power in love. Power, power in love. The, the older I get, the more infirmed I get, and the more I lean on Jesus. See, because when you were young, you thought you could lean on your own power. Am I right? The older you get, it hurts to get out of bed, and you can't wait to get back in bed. <laughs> it just comes with the territory. But I have begun to realize something. I think about the whole grand story of salvation itself. That, that God came among us in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. He came to show us the way. He came to show us the way to be more than we would be on our own. We could survive on our own, but he came to show us the way to be more than we would be on our own. He came to show us the way to be all that God has dreamed and intended since God said, let there be anything else beside God. J Jesus came to show us how to be right and reconciled with the God who is the Father, the creator of everything and of us all. He came to show us 
how to be right and reconciled with each other as children of this one God and creator of us own. In so doing, he came to show us how to become more than simply the human race. That is not good enough. It's a point of departure, but that's all it is. Jesus came to show us how to become the human family of God. And in that is our hope, temporal, and the key to salvation eternal. Now, forgive me for saying it this way, but being a member of the human race is not that much of an accomplishment. <laughs> Am I right? I mean, you didn't do anything. All you did was show up. It, it is not an accomplishment. They don't give out degrees or honorary or earned for being a member of the human race. Um, it's, it's, it's a good thing, it's a point of departure, but that's all it is. Um, and, and the truth of the matter is, uh, being a member of the human race is really essentially a biological category. It's a matter of basic biology. And, and, and I, I vaguely remember learning as a kid in school, and we took living things in eighth grade, which I think was early biology. And I remember they taught us that, that living things um, are, are divided into several categories. There are uh, mammals, there are animals, um, and then there are plants, if you will and that, that we're part of the animal world, we human beings, and we are, we are mammals. Uh, we don't like to admit it, but we are part of the animal world. But if you, if you ever see us act up, you know we are part of the animal world. <laughs> and, 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 and that the animal world has certain salient characteristics about it, um, uh, respiration, consumption, and reproduction. Um, we, we breathe, um, um, we, we, we eat, and we make more of our own kind. Now that's basic biology. Now, my wife has two cats. Who can do that? Well, actually, they can do two out of the three. They've been to the vet. You know, I mean, I mean eating and breathing and reproducing, that's basic biology, and that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. That's how the Lord made us. But, 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 but life is more than that. If it is more than biology, and if you go into the New Testament and look at the Greek New Testament, which is the language that the New Testament was originally written in, there are at least two different words that we can only translate into the word life. There is the word bios, that refers to basic bio, we get biology from that Greek word, and that's ordinary life. That's just basically existing life, if you will. And, and then there's zoe, which, which is life in its abundance life in its fullness, life that's more than mere biological life. Um, bios is what you get. Y'all ever watch Survivor? Anybody watch Survivor? That's that TV show where, where, the, girl, where, the, where the goal is to survive on this um, island out in the Pacific somewhere. And the way you survive is by getting rid of everybody else. Mere survival doesn't necessarily yield true life. Surviving is just existing. Surviving is just being. But life is more than that. Life, Jesus said, um, is not life more than food, the body more than clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, the birds of the air. Are you not of more value than even those priceless creatures of God? Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, I have come that you might have life, not just bios, but that you might have life and have it abundantly, life to its fullness, life as God dreamed and intended when God said, let there be life. And there was. Now you may be wondering, why is he saying all that? Because Jesus was very clear that the key to life is love. Oh, oh, stay with me now. The key to life is love. When the power of love overcomes the love of power, which is mere survival, then the world will know peace. 
I was watching television uh, this past Christmas. And um, Christmas vacation, I was home, wasn't traveling, and I happened to be channel surfing. And I went to CNN, and they were advertising a commercial for a show on Ruth Bader, Grins or Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Y'all know Justice Ginsburg on the Supreme Court. And it was entitled RBG, and they called her Notorious RBG. Some of y'all remember Notorious B.I.G. <laughs> See, Dr. Jones, they know the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so it's the Notorious R.B.G. And I, I, you know, I told somebody, I said, only in America could you get Notorious R.B.G. and Notorious B.I.G. in the same sentence. Only in America. But anyway, it was a, a story of the a documentary on the life of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who is a remarkable person. And I mean, she really is a remarkable person. And I mean, she's a cancer survivor three times. I mean, this is a tough, and she's a little bitty thing, but that's a tough sister, let me tell you. And, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg was advocating for equal rights for women and minority people in this country back in the 1960s when it was not safe, popular, or fashionable. And then when I think it was Bill Clinton finally put her on the Supreme Court, she has been, she has been David before the Goliaths of this world. She has stood by, she has taken up the mantle of the Thurgood Marshalls and carried it on. Anyway, in the course of the documentary, they talked about her and they said, you know, you are friends with the late Justice Anton Scalia who, as you all know, would, was a very conservative, strict constructionist, very conservative man. He, and the reporter said, you know, you and Justice Scalia don't agree on anything. And yet somehow you're, big, you're best friends. How is that possible? And she said, well, we both love opera. And, 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 and they went on to talk about they, they and their families used to go see opera. They, something that they had in common, they both loved opera. And that brought them together. And she said, we both love to travel. And, and, and she said, so, so we and our spouses would, would come together and we would travel all over the world together. And as she was saying that, I said, now, isn't that interesting? She used the word love. We both love to travel and we love opera. A common love created common ground. Stay with me. I'm coming to something. Don't worry. And then the, the, the journalist asked her to become law, law professor. And asked her, and I'm, I'm going to get in trouble because there are some lawyers in here. And, and he said, well, what is it that you, where's the common ground that you have in the law? And she said, we don't agree on what it means, but we both love the Constitution of the United States. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union establish domestic tranquility. We both love the Constitution of the United States. Would that we had leaders, I'm not being political, who loved and even knew the Constitution of the United States. Oh, oh, help me somebody. Would that we had leaders who, who stood up for the words of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, all people, all children of God are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Oh, would that we had some leaders like that. Oh, would that we, I'm not being political, this is biblical. Would that we had some leaders to stand up like Abe Lincoln in the Gettysburg Address four score and seven years ago, our forefathers landed upon this continent, established a new nation dedicated to the proposition that all people are created equal. Would that we had somebody who loved the Constitution again. And then Ruth Bader Ginsburg went on an excursus of the Constitution. I never thought I would be shouting off here somebody talking about the Constitution before. But I was standing on my feet waving my hand. She said in 1803-1804, there was a significant decision, Marbury versus Madison. Am I right, lawyers? Have I got that one right? 
Because see, up to that point in time, the states thought they um, held laws over the Constitution. They thought the Constitution was just kind of a nice set of suggestions, of recommendations that the states could ignore or accept. And when we had states' rights during the Civil Rights Movement, that's where a lot of that nonsense came from. And, and so the states weren't always willing to obey, if you will, the Constitution. And it was in the decision of Marbury versus Madison that the Supreme Court ruled definitively that the U.S. Constitution, check this language out, is the supreme law of the land and that it is the job of the Supreme Court to interpret that and all law, whether federal, state, or local, all public policies, administrative policies, federal, state, or local, must be consistent with the Constitution of the United States, and if they are not consistent, it is not American. It is not consistent with the Constitution to separate children from their parents at the border of the United States. That is un-American. But I'm not being political, I'm just being biblical. See, the truth of the matter is the Constitution with its amendments is the supreme law of the land. And anything that claims to be American must be consistent with that Constitution. Now stay with me, church. I'm coming to the point now. A lawyer came up to Jesus one day. Yeah. And the lawyer said to Jesus, what is the greatest law in the entire legal edifice of Moses? In other words, what is the Constitution of God? What is God's ultimate law by which all law and all behavior, all religion, all philosophy of life is to be judged? Now, Jesus knew that the rabbi said there were 613 laws attributed to Moses. And so Jesus reached back to the holiness code. He reached back to the purity codes. He went back to Leviticus, went back to Deuteronomy, and he said, I'll tell you the greatest law. He pulled from Deuteronomy and then pulled from Leviticus, and he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and great commandment, and the second one is just like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love. Love God, love your neighbor, and while you're at it, love yourself. That's God's law. That's the supreme law. And the truth of the matter is, I don't care. I'm, I'm going to get in trouble now, but, but, but I got, I'm leaving town this afternoon. <laughs> that, that, that I don't care how good a preacher may sound. I don't care how religious a right-wing preacher may sound. If it doesn't jive with love, it is not from God. Oh, Duke Ellington said, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that sway. If it's not about love, it is not about God. Oh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first and the great one. But the second is just like it because it is a derivative of the first. 1 John says, you cannot love God whom you have not seen and do not love your brother or sister who you have seen. You love God, that means you like to love your neighbor. Love the Lord your God. Oh, let me tell you why. Because God loves you. Whether you believe it or not, whether you feel it or not, God loves, I can prove it. You hear Whatever moment of life we've been given, it's a gift. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. It's gift. Gratis grace. Amazing grace. How did Barack Obama say? Amazing grace. How sweet. Oh, Barack can do that song. That's the only one he can do, but that, he can do that song. No, we are here by grace. And God loved you so much 
that he gave his only begotten son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish but have everlasting. God so loves you, so loves me, so loves every child of God. God's love knows no borders. God's love differentiates no colors, no political ideology, no wealth or class, no sexual orientation. God loves those whom God has made. The Bible says in God's image and likeness. Oh, you might as well love the Lord because he loves you and ain't nothing you can do. Yes, he <laughs> Love the Lord your God. But secondly, Jesus said, quoting Moses, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now I want you to notice carefully what the master said. He said, you shall love your neighbor. Now the word that is used consistently in these passages here is specifically is the word agape, which is a particular, the Greek language has multiple words for the one word that we can translate love. The word eros, philia, and agape. Eros, we get er erotic, uh, it's romantic love. Um, and so when Plato, in his, some of his plays, talks about romantic love, he uses the word eros. Um, philia um, is for fraternal love, um, um, uh, you know, uh, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. The word agape is the one that's used here. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Agape is unselfish love. It is, it is love that seeks the good and the welfare of the other. Um, agape makes room and space for the other to be. Um, and Jesus said, you shall agape, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, there was another lawyer in Luke 10 who asked Jesus, he said, Jesus, this is good that you shall love the Lord your God and you shall love your neighbor as yourself, but could we define neighbor? See, that's always the game. Can, can we limit the definition of neighbor to those who live in my hood who agree with me. And Jesus said, no, that's when Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan. Somebody who was the opposite of what this guy, somebody Jesus knew this guy who was talking to him could not stand. He said, that's your neighbor. And the real question isn't just who's your neighbor. The question is, to whom are you a neighbor? No, whether you like it or not, the neighbor is everybody else that the Lord has created next to you. That means everybody else. That means, Lord have mercy, Democrats, y'all got to find and love a Republican neighbor. Help me somebody. Oh, I'm, oh, the church getting quiet, Doc. That means Republicans, you got to find a Democratic neighbor. And, and those of y'all who are independent, you can go either way. <laughs> It, it means you got to love your, 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 your fellow friendship neighbor. You got to love a Methodist neighbor. You got to love, I'm gonna get in trouble, a Muslim neighbor. You got to love a Jewish neighbor. You got to love a rich neighbor. You got to love a poor neighbor. You got to love a straight neighbor. You got to love a gay neighbor. You got to love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor. Oh. Now, I want to get a quick caveat. Jesus didn't say you have to like him. <laughs> he did say you got to love him. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor. Oh, when the power of love overcomes the love of power, then we really will know peace. The truth is, we were made by the hand of God. And 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8 says, Beloved, let us love one another because love is of God, and those who love are born of God and know God. Why? Because God is love. The hand of God's love made you and made me and made everything. And that, that the hand, we are the handiwork of God. We are the work of God's love. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor. If we would just love our neighbors, we'd have a different Congress. 
Oh, we'd have a different White House. We'd have a different government. We'd have a different United Nations. We'd have a different world. Don't you tell me love cannot change it. Love is the only thing that has ever changed anything worth changing. Love God. Love your neighbor. And lastly, and I checked this out with a rabbi friend, he said it is clear that when Moses said love your neighbor as yourself and when Jesus reiterated it, implicit in the love of neighbor is love of self. That is not an add-on. It is implicit in the text. The truth is, you got to love yourself. Now, I'm not talking about selfish love. I'm not talking about inordinate self-love, as not Reinhold Niebuhr said. I'm not talking about um, uh, making yourself the center of the universe. It ain't all about you. And it's not all about me. It's about we. Um, but, but, but you got to have healthy respect for yourself because God made you out of love Therefore, you are the work of love, no matter what your parents did or didn't do, right? You are the work of God's love, working through human history and biology, and therefore, you are the product of love, and you are meant to be loved, meant to love, and meant to bear witness to love in this world. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor. And love yourself. Let me tell you something. I love me some Michael Curry. I, I do. I, I, I'm not cute like I used to be when we, we all were young. A few extra pounds. But let me tell you, I get up in the morning. I like to sing that, like that song. I wake up in the morning with my hair down in my eyes. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> I get up in the morning and kind of shake it off kind of get through those aches and pains, and I walk over to the, the vanity and turn on the light. Now I know why they call them vanities, because that light makes you look pretty even when you're not. <laughs> and, I, and I turn on the light, and I look into the mirror, and I look, kind of wipe the sleep out of my eyes, and I say, Denzel Washington, is that you? Oh, you pretty thing, you. Oh, my wife said, get back in bed, you old crazy fool. Get back in bed. <laughs> no, you got to love the Lord your God, love your neighbor, love yourself, and you will discover incredible power in loving God, loving your neighbor, and loving yourself. There is power for life in love. Well, I'm, I'm going to sit down now. So, some, some years ago, a number of years ago now, 1982, my wife and I moved from Winston-Salem uh, here, and, and I took a call to a church in Lincoln Heights, Ohio, just outside of Cincinnati, and, and served there as, as pastor for a number of years until 1988 or 89, and had many blessed and wonderful years there with the good people. Lincoln Heights is uh, one square mile. It's a historic black town. Um, that was established during the Great Migration from folk to the, in the rural south, um, moving up north, trying to go to Cleveland and, and Toledo and Detroit and Chicago, um, hoping for a better life. And um, anyway, uh, Lincoln Heights was kind of settled at that time, and it was a little black town. We were extremely poor. Um, it had been gerrymandered out of a tax base, um, and when, it was ger when the land was gerrymandered out, a General Electric plant was put there during the Second World War on land that was once part of Lincoln Heights. Um, and so it was left poor and bereft. Um, but that's, that's part of our history. Anyway, serving there um, was a wonderful time, and everything was just beautiful, and, and I, I, I have fond memories, except during the winter. See, the church sat here. You had the church, and you had the parish hall and offices and all of that, and then you had the parsonage where we lived. And behind all of that was a large field. And this large field in the summer was inhabited by non-religious mice. <laughs> and when winter came, 
the mice all got religion. And Mickey and Minnie and all their family, everybody, everybody came to church. And that meant that we had mice everywhere. Mice in the church itself, mice in the office complex in the center, mice in the parsonage where we live, mice everywhere. And so I went to the trustees, with the equivalent of the trustees, and said, can you all help us out? We really need to do something about this situation. And they said, well, we'll get an exterminator, but our oldest daughter then was probably two or three, and they didn't want to use, you know, the real powerful poisons and that kind of stuff. But they said, we'll get an exterminator who probably can handle it. And so we got this exterminator who came over and introduced himself by saying, uh, we specialize in nonviolent means of extermination. I was sitting there thinking, nonviolent means of extermination. I mean, I believe in nonviolence, but not when it comes to mice. You need to kill them jokers. <laughs> so, so, but I figured, well, let's give it a shot. So we gave it a shot, and they put out the glue traps. No poisons, the glue traps because they wanted to be environmentally sensitive too, which was appropriate, but it wasn't killing any mice. The mice would get on the glue traps and they were just playing on there like they're on a trampoline. <laughs> so that didn't work. And so finally a friend of ours named Liz Sorrell had two cats and a dog. And Liz said, um, you know, the, 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 the one of the cat and the dog are beating up on the other cat. And so I'll give you the other cat. I said, wait a minute. I want the cat who's winning the fight. I don't want the one who's losing the fight. And she said, no, 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 you can't have that one. But the, but the one who's losing the fight, she's a good mouser. I said, she's losing the fight already. But I didn't have any choice because nothing man was making was working. So I figured, try what God has made. And so, you know, I went over to, the house, to Liz's house and got one of those little carrying cases and went over to get the cat. And, and remember, there were two cats and a dog. And I opened the cage, and, and this cat, who had been beaten up all the time, that cat ran into the cage. I was telling somebody, I told the early service, I said, you heard of the school to prison pipeline? This was the first time I saw anybody happy to be incarcerated. <laughs> I mean, that cat ran in, into the little cage, and I said, oh, man, this is not going to work out very well. So anyway, but she was away from the cat and the dog who were beating her up, and so she, you know, I took it to the house, and... I remember opening the cage to show my wife, and, and she came out. She was one of these um, brown tortoiseshell looking, and she had like hair missing, different parts of her missing, and she was like real, she was a real needy cat, because you would pet her on the head, she'd be so happy, you would be a nice to her. She dribbling out her mouth and everything. It's just, and, and my wife looked and said, that's about the ugliest cat I think I have ever seen. Anyway, and I had asked Liz what the cat's name was, and she said, oh, her name is Muffin. I said, please tell me the cat's name is Killer or something. I'm just, they tell me it ain't Muffin. So we let Muffin out the cage, and, and Muffin, kind of, you know how cats kind of sniff around, and she eventually, we had a German Shepherd dog who, um, his, his name was Bishop. I thought that was funny then. Um, and, but I, because I used to say, there's going to be one Bishop in the Episcopal Church. When I say sit, Bishop, he going to sit. When I say roll over, Bishop, he going to roll over. He didn't sit and he didn't roll over, but anyway. <laughs> but Muffin and Bishop became friends and everything seemed to be going along well, but Muffin wasn't catching any mice. And so a friend of mine said, don't feed her that well. Keep her hungry. You want that lean, mean, hungry look on her. Then she'll catch some mice. Well, you know, eventually one night, I got up in the middle of the night to go get a cookie or something out of the kitchen. And as I turned in the corner to the living room, it was a full moon, and the, moon, the moonlight was coming through the window in the living room. And you could see in the living room, you could see shapes, and I could see Muffin down in that, you see him in that crouching tiger position? And I could tell she's hunting. And I watched her. Now this is the same cat who you pet her on the head, she blah, 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 dribbling all out of her mouth. And, I mean, this was a dysfunctional cat normally. But I watched her, and, and she was almost stealth. And I said, That's, it's a, have you ever seen a cat hunt? It's a beautiful thing, unless you the mouse. <laughs> anyway, Muffin was down in her crouching tiger position, and I watched Muffin. She went down, 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 down. And then up, oh, she got it. Mickey Mouse bit the dust. I saw it. My man was history. 
Many had it next, everybody. I mean, she, it was incredible. I couldn't believe it. And then from that point on, Muffin was hunting every night. She would disappear from the bedroom, and she'd be in that living room, and the rest of the house, she was hunting. There, she was killing so many mice. At one time, I went through the, back, went through the um, uh, uh, living room in the morning, and you had to walk. It's like going through a cemetery. You had to walk. It got so bad, there were headstones in the living room. <laughs> Mickey Mouse, born here, expired here. I mean, one morning in the middle of the night, I got up to go to the bathroom, I guess it was, and, and I got up and put my foot in my slipper. I said, what? I picked up the slipper and took out, there was half a mouse still there. My wife said, see, you have a hard time getting folks just to tithe 10% in the church. She gave the Lord half of what he gave her. Anyway, Muffin kept hunting mice, and eventually, at the end of the winter, we didn't have any mice, and by the next winter, this is the honest to God truth, we did not have a mouse problem in our house the next winter. There were no mice. I don't know how it happened. I don't know because cell phones didn't exist yet, so I know they weren't tweeting and texting each other, but somehow, the word went out to every mouse and nation, do not go near that house. They got a bad cat named Muffin in that house. And I realized something. As long as Muffin was being mistreated and not allowed to be who and what the Lord put her on this earth to be, Muffin was dysfunctional. But when Muffin was loved and cared for and taken care of and respected for who she was, Muffin wasn't just any old ordinary cat. Muffin became super cat. Oh. My grandma used to sing that song, it is no secret what God can do, what he did for old Paul, he'll do for you. Church, I'm here to tell you, it is no secret what God can do, what he did for Muffin, he'll do for you. Oh, love, love can lift up and liberate when nothing else can. Love can heal and help when nothing else will. Because when the power of love overcomes the love of power, then the world will know peace. Jesus came to show us the way, and love is that way. Oh, God love you. Friendship, God bless you. And may God hold us all in those almighty hands of love. Love. God bless you. God bless you. Oh, God bless you. Well, we've had baptisms today. New disciples of Jesus. What a blessing. And we've had church today, and what a blessing. Oh, my grandma used to sing that old song, I was sinking deep in sin, far from a distant shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the waters. He lifted me, now safe. Now safe am I. What does it say? Oh, love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else would help. Love lifted me. Oh, help me, church. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. you 
while we're all standing, if you would like to come this day and give your life to Jesus as your Lord, your Savior, as your friend and brother for life and life eternity. You just come on down wherever you are. Come on. Don't be ashamed and don't you be afraid. Wherever you are, you just come on. Love lifted me. There may be somebody here right now standing in the need of prayer or somebody for whom you want to pray. Right now, name that person in your heart and pray for them to the Lord our God. And there may be somebody here who's got to go out in that tired, sometimes cold and cruel world. I'm here to tell you. Go, go, yeah, you come on up, come on up, come on up, yeah, yeah. come on up. No. Somebody who just wants to say, thank you, Jesus. There's a thank you, Jesus. Let me see a hand. Just raise that hand and say, thank you, Jesus. Go out in that world. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, gracious and heavenly Father, for those who have come forward this day to give their life to your Son, our Savior, Jesus. We lay our hands on them, and I want you all to stretch your hands out toward our sister right here. Stretch your hands out toward her. We ask you to be with her and those who have come forward. May they receive the blessing of your love in its fullness and its goodness. May they know the power of your peace. May they so walk in love that they may find the path of life. And to all of us here, dear Lord, lead us in the ways of your love. Help us to follow in the footsteps of Jesus and rise to newness of life. Now may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to each one of us. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon us and give us his peace. And now, dear people of God, go forth into this world. Be strong and of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. But love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor. And love yourself. The blessing of our God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, be with you and with the entire human family this world in which we live, this day and forevermore. And the people of God said, amen. Amen. and amen. amen. God love you and God bless you.